Uh, so I guess, yes, recording. Um, yeah, I guess you've already heard the title of my talk and you can see it here. So uh, this is uh, uh, based on a paper that I've written together with Louis Spath and Professor Raul Tempone. Uh, you can find a, a preprint on archive. Uh, yeah. So here's uh, kind of the outline of my talk. I will first uh, give a short introduction on uh, Bayesian experimental design. Um, and then I will focus on the small noise approximation that is the, the novel approach uh, that we uh, follow. Uh, and then I will give uh, expected information gain estimators. So we derive two estimators. Um, for the expected information gain, I will introduce this quantity. Um, and then I show numerical results. Uh, so basically, if you conduct an experiment, you, you can think of uh, scientific experiments or uh, whatever you may be doing. Um, then what you can do is you uh, find a mathematical model um, that depends, depends on, on parameters of interest uh, that you wish to learn about. Uh, and then your data is given by this, this model plus noise. So we, uh, we assume additive noise. Um, or in, in mathematical terms, now we have here the, the data y is, is this mathematical model g, depending on the parameters of interest uh, plus the noise. Um, and then what you can do is uh, you make the design of the experiment specific. So whenever you conduct an experiment, uh, you have to choose a certain design. Basically, this could be uh, where you measure your data or how many measurements you take or uh, at what time you measure. Uh, whatever it is that uh, you can choose beforehand is the design. And uh, obviously, uh, the data that you get will depend on this design, and you can optimize over it. So uh, for example, if you measure at the same spot uh, 50 times and nowhere else, then chances are you won't uh, really find interesting results. So uh, clearly, you can, you can choose an optimal design. Uh, and this is the task we will follow. Um, but uh, we make our lives slightly harder. We assume that the model not only depends on the parameters of interest, but also other parameters. Uh, and if the parameters are not of interest, they are called nuisance. So basically they uh, add to the overall uncertainty of the model. Um, but we do not wish uh, to minimize the, or, or we cannot minimize this uncertainty. So basically, um, yeah, as I said, we want to learn about the parameters of interest. So we want to gain information, but in, in terms of information theory, uh, gaining information is, is the same thing as reducing uncertainty. Uh, so we can find an optimal design that reduces the uncertainty in the parameters of interest. Um, but then if we found a design that also minimizes the uncertainty in the nuisance parameters, then this would compromise uh, the optimal design for the parameters of interest. So we do not want to do this. Um, but this means we have to deal with the nuisance parameters in, in some other way. Uh, yeah, just to recap, so uh, we, we not only do this experiment once, we, we do it multiple times with the same design, with the same setup. Uh, so then we get uh, different noise, and this can help to, to reduce the noise that comes from the model. So this, this noise, basically the interpretation is, uh, if you have a measurement device, uh, then, then you know that if you measure at the same time, at the same spot multiple times, you get slightly different results because uh, unfortunately nothing is perfect. Um, yeah, they just assumed that this, uh, this uh, noise is Gaussian yeah. and is independent for the model. So this covariance matrix uh, you can see down here uh, is assumed to be diagonal. Um, yeah, and the other quantities I already introduced. I'm, so, I'm sorry, a small question, Arvid. Um, so left hand side in this equation depends on xi and right on xi theta phi. Uh, is it because you integrate theta and phi or? Yeah, that's uh, right. That, that is basically the whole task. We have to integrate over theta and phi. Okay, good. And then if, uh, yeah, are they all independent? Or the spaces, uh, random spaces where xi, theta and phi live? Yeah, is they are, are they orthogonal to each other? Or it could be one big space. Or uh, we did consider them to be independent. 
Is it independent? Yes. 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 Okay. I, okay. I don't thank you. Yeah. Maybe this could be done, but I, I would assume it makes life much more difficult. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If anyone else has any questions or, or you have more questions, please just interrupt. Uh, I'm sorry. Nadir, are you recording this video? Maybe I miss or you forgot to record? I had to confirm that the meeting was recorded. Yes, I am recording. OK, so yeah, what we do in, in Bayesian design, we have uh, four quantities, as I will now introduce. So, so four probability density functions um, that we will be dealing with. So we have the prior distribution of our parameters of interest. So this is basically our knowledge before we conduct an experiment. This may be from previous experiments or just a good guess or expert knowledge, whatever we know about uh, the parameters of interest beforehand is given by the prior distribution. Then we have the posterior distribution. Um, this is uh, the density of the parameters of interest conditioned on the data. So this is what we know after uh, doing the experiment. Um, then we have the likelihood function, which is the, the density of the data conditioned on the model parameters. And finally, the evidence, which is the, the, just the density of the data. So I distinguish here between densities of the parameters and density of the data by uh, notation. I use pi for the parameters of interest and, and p for the data, but I also color coded this. Uh, so you can see that um, the orange ones we have access to and the blue ones we do not have access to. So we have to find some expression that only depends on the orange terms. Um, so yeah, the, the prior distribution is obviously given ahead of time. Uh, this is all that we know uh, ahead of the experiment. And now if we uh, move in the in the model, if we move the, the mathematical model G to the left hand side, uh, you can see here the residuals uh, are then basically given by a normal distribution um, that is centered around uh, the model predictions. And it has uh, the same covariance matrix as the noise because that's all that's left on the other side. Uh, yeah, and it, it is given by this expression on the bottom. But yeah, this still depends on the nuisance parameters. So now we will deal with those. So what we assume is that the, the nuisance parameters are uh, given by this normal distribution. Uh, we use here a centered normal distribution. This is not, uh, not important. We can uh, just add a constant later on. Uh, and it has a certain covariance matrix. And then what we can do is we do first order Taylor expansion. So this is given here. Uh, basically, we, we evolve around uh, the residuals at phi is equal to zero, so no noise. And uh, then we can use this. Uh, yeah, and, and what you see is so uh, we cut off the, the uh, second order terms, but the first order term uh, depends on, on two quantities, basically. It's the, it's the gradient of the model. Uh, with regard to the nuance parameters, so this this kind of expresses how how much the model depends on on the on the nuisance parameters and also the covariance here of the nuisance. So if if both of those are fairly small, then uh, we should be good. If if one of them becomes big, then we run into trouble. Uh, so what we do now is we marginalize the nuisance parameters, uh, so we can basically integrate over them. And this is here expressed by this, uh, this expectation. So yeah, we take the expectation just uh, with regard to the nuisance parameters. I'm sorry, and, Arvid, I interrupt you. Yeah. Small noise, you put it in the title. It seems to be very important. Is yeah. it because you have such problem settings or it's because your algorithm is working only for small noise? Yes, again, uh, you kind of uh, go ahead. This is what I will show now that uh, if the noise becomes large, then uh, this breaks down. Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, I guess you're very attentive. So this, this will be shown uh, first, uh, kind of, I just hint at it. And then later for the examples, we will show some, some figures also where this happens. Yeah, this is basically, uh, yeah, it, it okay, I, I will get to that. So we plug in the tail expansion uh, just for this, uh, this expectation term here. Uh, 
And then uh, what we do is um, we can take out this first term because this does not depend on. So what we do now is we have the, the expectation only um, with regard to this, this set here. This is the only thing now that is uh, in question. So this, this first term is independent. Uh, so we can take it out of the expectation. And the second term, you can see that uh, you have the, uh, the expectation of the exponential of, of basically some, some big constant, then your uh, random variable, and then the high, higher order terms. Um, so this is basically the expectation of a log normal. And we know what it is if we uh, neglect the second order terms. So we can compute it analytically and we get this expression. So now we have an approximation for the likelihood that only depends on the parameters of interest. Um, and what we gained is this, uh, this factor here, C, this update factor. And uh, what this does is basically it, uh, it takes all the uncertainty that comes from the nuisance parameters and it uh, increases the, the uncertainty that comes from the noise. So basically this, this is the, the noise covariance. And then we have a new covariance that also depends on the nuisance. Um, so if you look at this, this expression for C, um, what you see is that uh, if, if, either, if either this covariance is small or this gradient is small or both, um, then this whole term is, is fairly small and C is close to the identity. Then we have the old setting um, where we don't have nuisance parameters. And, uh, but if this becomes big, then, then C uh, becomes close to zero. And uh, then we run into trouble because uh, it might even happen that the C becomes negative, but then this covariance matrix, this updated covariance matrix um, is no longer positive definite. So the, the covariance matrix has to be positive definite. That's uh, how it's defined. So then we cannot uh, use this small noise approximation. And this is also why it's called small noise. So uh, basically that we have to assume that this, this quantity has to be small. Um, yeah, and, and we, we also derived some, some bound on this. Basically it depends on the eigenvalues. Um, so for a, yeah, as I say here, uh, if, if sigma phi is diagonal, then the, the eigenvalues are just the entries on the diagonal uh, and they have to be small compared to, um, compared to the entries on the diagonal of sigma epsilon. Um, the problem here is that the, this gradient still depends on theta. So we do not have a, a, a good bound on this because it's, it's only a probabilistic bound. Yeah, but this is, this is basically what we do. So we, we recover the old setting where we do not have nuisance parameters anymore, uh, but we, we increase the, the model noise basically. And it only works if, if the nuisance uncertainty is small. So now uh, I said we, we want to uh, derive the amount of information we gain from conducting the experiment. Um, and we do this uh, using the kullback leibler divergence. So this quantity basically uh, is given here and it tells us how much information we gain from conducting the experiment. So it is the, the integral over theta of the logarithm of the posterior minus the logarithm, logarithm of the prior. Um, it's, maybe a bit hard to see why this quantity expresses the amount of information we gain, but just to give you some intuition, if, if the, um, so if, if this quantity is large, then we gain a lot of information. And basically if the, if the prior of the model is uh, say very flat, and then we have the posterior that is very sharply peaked, uh, then this quantity is, is large. And if, if both the prior and the, and the posterior are flat, um, then we do not learn a lot. Um, yeah, and this also depends on a specific data vector. So we also integrate over the data um, because we want to derive this quantity before conducting the experiment. So basically we take the expectation over all of the data and then we have the expected information gain, uh, which is given here on the bottom. But as I said earlier, uh, this has a lot of blue terms and we do not have access to the blue terms. So we have to uh, use some, some mathematical trickery to uh, turn them into orange terms. 
uh, we do this using Bayes theorem and the law of total probability. So, so first, um, this, this first equation here is Bayes theorem. So that the posterior is given as the likelihood times the prior over the evidence. Uh, and we already used the, the small noise approximation here. So there's no more, um, no more nuisance parameters. Maybe uh, if you've noticed, we have also uh, neglected to show the design. This uh, still depends on design. I, I just got rid of it uh, to make it less confusing because um, yeah, optimizing, finding the optimal design is, is beyond the scope of this work. So uh, the why still depends on the design, but it's not specified. Um, yeah, as you can see here, uh, so we still have one blue term left. So what we do is we condition on uh, theta and then we marginalize. So here in the denominator, uh, we have only terms that we have access to. And I used here var theta just to distinguish it from the theta in the, in the numerator. Um, yeah. So now we plug this into the expression for the EIG and we get this uh, quantity on the bottom. So this is now the amount of information we gain from conducting the experiment, um, only in terms we have access to. The problem with this quantity uh, is that we have nested integrals. So maybe some of you have seen this before, maybe some of you have not. Um, I'm not talking about uh, these integrals. Those are just basically uh, two integrals. One might consider them one higher dimensional integral. The problem is with this integral over theta and this integral over theta. And uh, in between, we have this logarithm function, which is nonlinear. So for any nonlinear function here, this means that we have to basically uh, do this in a nested setting. And also we cannot typically uh, integrate these analytically. So we have to use uh, some approximation method. Uh, we use Monte Carlo. So this, the, the first approach is to just use Monte Carlo for both of these integrals. Uh, and then we can see that here, the, the first estimator we propose is the double loop estimator with small noise. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, yeah, if for every outer loop, we have to solve a whole integral in the middle. So we have for the outer loop, we have n samples. For the inner loop, we have m samples. Uh, and this, of course, means that the total samples is n times m. So uh, this will get expensive quickly. So this is this more expensive than just regular Monte Carlo. Uh, and I will show this. So, uh, yeah, for Monte Carlo, we can uh, approximate any integral um, by drawing random samples from, from the appropriate probability distributions that I've given here on the bottom. And then, um, yeah, using a finite sum, and the more samples we use, uh, the better the approximation. So what we also do is the model, if uh, for most interesting, uh, problems, the, the model depends on some partial differential equation. Uh, so what we do then is we use finite elements and we approximate with uh, a discretization and, and we call the, the discretization parameter H. Um, so, and, and we assume that the uh, weak convergence rate um, as H goes to infinity is given by this H over eta. And uh, also that the work associated with evaluating this, this function is uh, h to the minus gamma for, for some constants eta and gamma. Um, so yeah, if we assume this, then we can derive the total work of this double loop estimator. Uh, and it is given by this expression. So what typically happens is whoever wants us to find this optimal design tells us, okay, uh, do your estimation, but your error has to be uh, below a certain tolerance. Uh, and then we have to basically take as many samples as, as we need uh, to be below this tolerance, but uh, obviously not too many. So we have to find an optimization problem because we, if we use too many samples, it will be too expensive. And what we find is that this double loop estimator uh, has cost of uh, tolerance to minus three plus the terms from the uh, finite element approximation. And this is more expensive than, than regular Monte Carlo approximation. Um, but it is uh, the same rate 
is uh, for the model without nuisance parameters. So this is the good thing about our, our model. Basically, we recover the, the rate without nuisance parameters. The bad thing is it breaks down if the nuisance uncertainty is too big. Uh, yeah, how do we show this? We split the, the total error between the actual expected information gain and the estimator into a bias component and a statistical component. Uh, yeah, basically, this is just a triangle inequality. Um, and then we introduce a splitting parameter and say uh, the total tolerance uh, has to be split between these, these two components. Uh, yeah, then, then we can find the splitting parameter and also find the optimal number of samples. And then we use the central limit theorem to replace the statistical uh, bound by a variance bound, uh, because this is easier to handle. So the central limit th uh, theorem tells us that the variance of our estimator is uh, smaller than this uh, tolerance with a probability one minus alpha. Um, so yeah, we want to choose alpha small then, uh, typically uh, that we have a 95% uh, confidence bound. Uh, yeah, and then this, this constant C alpha is given by the inverse CDF of uh, the standard normal. Yeah, so what we do then is we plug everything in um, and we optimize uh, the, the work that is given by the number of outer samples times the number of inner samples times the, the mesh discretization. So the, the work to evaluate the forward model once um, uh, with these bias and variance constraints. And doing this optimization, we find that the, the number of outer samples is of order tolerance to the minus two, the number of uh, inner samples tolerance to the minus one, and, and the discretization is of the order tolerance to the eta, which is the, the weak rate of the, of the PDE solver. Uh, and this, if we, yeah, then, then this gives us this aforementioned bound. Um, yeah, as I said, this is fairly expensive. So the next estimator we propose is the uh, Monte Carlo Laplace estimator um, that was already introduced uh, in the literature. Uh, what we do here is we take an, an, a direct approximation of the uh, posterior distribution. So basically, we, we solve the inner integral uh, analytically um, using this, uh, this approximation. So basically, we, we have some uh, PDF in the inner loop, and we just approximate it by a normal distribution that is uh, centered around this um, theta hat. Uh, theta hat is the uh, map estimation, the maximum a posteriori estimation. So as you can see here, it only depends on uh, known quantities. It, it again uh, includes this, this update factor C and the prior distribution. Uh, so we have to solve an optimization method here. Uh, and the, the covariance of this um, of this approximation uh, is given down here. Uh, it, it also only includes uh, known quantities. Um, yeah, but uh, the problem with this is that we get a bias. So if we look at the estimator, the Monte Carlo Laplace estimator with small noise, um, we find here that the, this estimator has a bias that is uh, indirectly proportional to the number of experiments. So I have not really talked about this. Um, yeah, basically, if you do the experiment more than once, then, then the, uh, the noise, uh, the, the, the additive noise decreases. Um, but uh, this uh, is not in our control. So if uh, whoever wants us to find this, this optimal design says they have no budget, um, to do the experiment more than once, then we cannot use this, this estimator. Uh, for the other estimator, we can just increase the, the number of inner samples, and this is within uh, our, uh, our possibilities. Uh, yeah, but if this does work, uh, then we find that uh, this is of order tolerance to the minus two, basically. So uh, we gain one order of magnitude, uh, and then everything uh, works fine. Um, but we, what we also can do is we can use this posterior approximation and we use it for important sampling for the inner loop in the double loop estimator. Um, so important sampling is, is basically you 
your sample from a different distribution and then um, you update that you still get the, the correct uh, mean value. So you keep the mean of your approximation. So it is still unbiased, but you reduce the, uh, the variance. So you need fewer samples. And uh, this um, can be shown that we do not reduce the order, um, but we can reduce the constant factor in, in the number of samples. And this, this may still be a, a big thing. So now for our examples, uh, first we show just a linear example. It, it is fairly straightforward. Uh, the model is just given by this uh, factor matrix and, and we multiply with the uh, parameters. And then we assume the following distribution. So the noise is, is a, a centered normal distribution. Um, the parameters of interest are centered around this, this vector E here. And the nuisance parameters are, are also given by centered normal distribution with some uh, uh, standard deviation sigma phi. Um, so, and what we find then is that if sigma phi is, is larger than 10 to the minus eight, uh, the small noise approximation breaks down. And uh, yeah, this is already fairly small. And yeah, you can see here what happens. So if the nuisance uncertainty is small, everything is fine, everything works. But then if it passes a certain threshold, suddenly uh, we lose uh, a lot of information. And, and this is already the, the bound here on the right. If, if we go any further, if we increase the nuisance uncertainty, the updated covariance matrix loses positive definiteness and we do not get anything anymore. Yeah, the second example was used by Feng and colleagues uh, to illustrate uh, what, what the design does in, in relation to nuisance uncertainty or no nuisance uncertainty. So now I will show what actually happens if you um, try to reduce the model uncertainty coming from the um, parameters of interest and the nuisance parameters versus just the uh, parameters of interest. So basically this is a very simple model and we have the, the added advantage that it can be solved analytically. So we, we can check that everything is working. Uh, yeah, we, we can assume normal distributions for all of our parameters. And what we find is that uh, basically we have two cases here. We have on the top, we have the, um, we have the case without nuisance. So basically we, we just assume that the, the nuisance parameters are also parameters of interest and we want to find the optimal design um, uh, for both parameters. And this is uh, higher than the lower case uh, for every design. Um, but this is clear because now we, we obtain information about two parameters. So, so we gain more information, but how much information we gain is not really important. What, what is important that the optimum for this top case is that uh, Xi is one half. And the, the optimal case for the, the, for the lower case with nuisance uncertainty is for Xi equals one. So we obtain a different optimal design depending on if we reduce the uncertainty in the just the parameters of interest or also the nuisance parameters. Um, and what you can also see is that uh, both of our estimators, the Monte Carlo Laplace estimator and the double loop Monte Carlo estimator with important sampling, they were both able to uh, capture the analytical solution um, and uh, equally well uh, for both cases, except here at the, at the edges where the model is not uh, injective and uh, this, this is a problem of the model, not of our estimators essentially. Yeah, and what we can see here is uh, the, the rate of the uh, increase of the number of samples for all of our estimators for the case with nuisance uncertainty and without. And basically what you see is that uh, both the left and the right picture look mostly the same. Uh, so what we can see is that for all three estimators, the, um, the asymptotic rates are the same, only the constant factors are, are slightly different. And in fact, we found that um, the constants are actually smaller in the case without nuisance uncertainty. So we actually save uh, some cost by doing this. Um, I guess this is probably because uh, these, these constants have to be estimated. So there's a certain uh, uh, uncertainty in that. 
but also that uh, we have, as I said, we have more noise, basically from more model noise in the case with nuisance uncertainty, but we have uh, a smaller parameter space. So this, this is probably what accounts for this uh, lower variance here. Uh, yeah, so basically what you can see is that the, um, the, the Monte Carlo Laplace estimator here is, is this one in both cases. Um, yeah, so this, this is basically, for the most part, it's exactly the same for both cases. And also the, the double loop Monte Carlo estimator with important sampling. Uh, if you just look at the inner samples, uh, those ones, compared to uh, the inner samples of uh, just the, the Monte Carlo estimator. So yeah, first of all, for moderate uh, to large tolerances, we, we have only one inner sample. So this is basically the same cost as for the Monte Carlo Laplace estimator where the important sampling works so well that we only need one in the sample to, to solve this whole integral. Uh, and then even if it starts increasing, uh, basically there's, there's a, a big gap here uh, between using important sampling and, and no important sampling. And the, the third example is where we show that we can also practically apply this, this small noise approximation. Um, so we use electrical impedance tomography. Um, what we do here, is we have uh, we, we have a composite laminate material. So basically we have two plies uh, glued together and these, these plies have a fiber structure. So basically um, they, they consist of fibers with a certain angle and they are uh, non-isotropic. So uh, electric uh, current is, is um, conducted better uh, along the direction of the fibers and worse transversal to the fibers. So if we attach electrodes to this material and uh, send electric current through the material and, and then measure the outcome, we can recover this fiber angle. And this is what we do. So the, the angle of the fibers is the parameter of interest in, in both plies. Um, the conductivity, uh, we consider a nuisance parameter. So basically this means um, we do not know Exact, the exact conductivity of our material. Um, and the goal of the experiment is to find the fiber angles. It is not to find the exact conductivity. Um, so if, if we wanted to find the exact conductivity, maybe we would uh, not have the optimal setup to, to find the fiber angle. And the design of the experiment is the placement of the electrodes. So basically we have uh, two, two factors here. One, we have this, this shift in between top and bottom electrodes. Uh, and the, the other one is the distance between electrodes on the top and on the bottom. So we can choose this. Um, yeah, and you can also see what happens if we, if we inject current, then it, it travels from the inlet electrodes to the outlet electrodes. So yeah, this is the idea of the EIT. Um, yeah, and then we have a, a PDE that, as I said, we approximate using finite elements. And we model the orthotropic conductivity uh, as a log normal. And yeah, we assume these distributions. So we, we again have a normal distribution for the noise. Uh, we have a uniform distribution this time for the fiber angle uh, for each ply. And yeah, we have to assume an, an even smaller uh, uh, covariance for the nuisance parameters. But what we find is, uh, so first of all, the, yeah, the optimal design uh, depends, obviously you've, you've already seen basically the optimal design. So the, the electrodes have to be spread apart and there has to be a shift between top and bottom electrodes. So one might have maybe even guessed this, but what may be interesting is that uh, the optimal design depends much more um, on the shift between top and bottom electrodes rather than the distance. So, so basically we can see here that if you move uh, the electrodes on the top and the bottom uh, close to each other, then, then you don't lose much, but it is important that there's a shift between top and bottom electrodes. Yeah, and that's it for my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, 